Thank you, everybody. And I hope you can hear me. Um, I've just had an upgrade with my broadband. I'm calling, I'm speaking from Edinburgh, but hopefully everything should be according to plan. So, but um, I think I'll be, it's, the, the organisers will inform me if something drops. But at the moment, I can't see you, but I can see my slides, which I think is the important thing in terms of this talk. Um, so I think my brief was to actually look at school design, particularly, or educational design in West Africa. And I've, I'm looking at it from a post-independence, um, so that's from the 1960s onwards period. This was a time contextually when the whole idea about education for all was very much in the forefront of international development thinking. And the picture you can see in front of you is my first picture, is a picture in a township about 10 miles away from Kumasi, which is in central Ghana, where um, certainly education was very much a big policy issue. And the idea was that these, there would be enough schools to educate everybody. And so this is the international narrative. So that by 1970, all children in the world should have a free primary education. The building you can see in the background is probably a standard primary school building that you'd find throughout Ghana and variations of it throughout um, West Africa, deaf, or English-speaking West Africa, because I know my next speaker will be talking particularly about Guinea-Bissau, which is different again. But for the Anglophone countries, the idea was very much a primary education would be free. That's the way the colonists left West Africa in the 1960s. Ghana, in many ways, was very inspired. They had a lot put into investment, put into education, and some form of school was being built everywhere. Often, in already there had been a missionary development of schools right up to sec secondary uh, and even um, higher education. But what I'm focusing today on are the spaces in which education take place. And I'll actually be moving across from both schools right up to some ideas of university spaces um, which have also taken place. Um, so just going on. So the idea was very much that could, in, in the Ghanaian case in West Africa, the idea was could they find ways in which they could mass produce um, spaces for um, all forms of social infrastructure. The reason I've got the picture on at the moment is to do with it being a picture I found during a NORAID exhibition in Kenya. Now, take a look at the arches. That's what I'm really interested in. But these are basically a development of buildings which have used prefabricated arch structures to create spaces for schools and other environments. The reason the arches are very important are because when I show you the next image, uh, you can see what is the Tema School Design, which was designed by an architectural association trained architect, Patrick Wakeley. And he pr produced an idea about um, the, creating a number of primary schools in a new town called Tema, then in the 1960s, using these prefabricated elements. So the picture to the right, this is the way the schools were actually built. Picture to the left is these prefabricated elements again, this time being used for a marketplace in Tema as well. So there's very much the idea about how can we use construction to create spaces for things which would not necessarily only be education. It's the idea about using the prefabricated forms and then being able to use them for various forms of social infrastructure. The top a uh, bit here is to do with the relationship of this to the ideas of environmental design principles at the time. So he went on to design a series of these schools. This is the one for indeed Tama New Newtown. The idea was very much around the schools being properly cross ventilated and you're being able to use fast systems of construction. In Tema, a new town that was created in the 19, well, planned in the 19 late 1950s and really built in the 1960s, there were eight neighborhood communities and each neighborhood community would have one of these schools. Now, my critique about these schools is that there's no real difference in terms of the school area, the classroom area that is being proposed for these um, children to be educated in. Now, there's, there are two problems. One is that the educational mode suggests that it is very much if you like the traditional Western, or in this case, English school system 
um, of education. The teacher is in front. There are normally, on average, 35 children in each classroom. And that's the kind of UNESCO standard that we have inherited. I think possibly this might be a situation where the, this could be a sliding um, panel. But generally, the school design standards were very much limited to what was considered appropriate back in the 1950s. So in many ways, the school spaces, the internal spaces, and they were internal spaces, were planned at a time when there was not as much pressure on children going to school, despite the policy at, a national, at an international level being all children should be in school. Interestingly, the courtyard areas are not for education. The courtyard areas were simply to uh, children for children to come to and, uh, you know, at the at the um, break times and so on, they could actually socialize there. But the idea was always that the school would or the education would still take place in these spaces. So my talk today is really sort of to challenge why, um, in many ways, the idea about the education taking place was still very much curtailed in it being in a setting that was bounded by um, um, by walls and a ceiling and so on, despite, for most of tropical Africa, the ability for people to really um, use the um, outdoors as a space both for leisure but also possibly for education. So just continuing to show that even in different settings, so Pat Wakeley went on to do a series of these uh, designs for different areas. But these, this was the state system. Now, interestingly, my second case study, which I talk about, which is the international school Ibadan, is almost the opposite in the sense that this was built for the expatriate staff of university, uh, or expatriate staff children. So at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. So a lot of the staff then, when the school, when the, the University of Ibadan was um, first initiated in the late 1950s, right up until the 1970s, more than 50% of staff were expatriate or non Nigerians, and they wanted an international school for their children. And you can immediately see both the international design, but the idea about the piloti, so there's free form space underneath the uh, main, this is the main classroom block, and um, above it is um, accommodation, it's a boarding school. Uh, but what really took my interest was an open air, in this case, it was an open air cafeteria, which is very unusual, because Generally, the narrative around all spaces, be they leisure or, or um, educational spaces, was that they would be indoors. But this discussion about experimenting in terms of space for educational facilities had already begun. This, was, this is 1965. Uh, I reckon early 1965, Design Group is a British company that was based in Nigeria at the time. And they, if you like, had begun to look at the idea about open spaces for education. So there's obviously a discussion around possibly the, uh, I guess, the bourgeoisie, the higher classes being more willing to experiment with space, just to show you the, the entire um, layout. So we were looking at this area here, and that's the open air um, cafeteria social space. And below, this is the area from the earlier slide, this is the same area here, yeah. So looking at it from here, this is actually social and recreational space for the boarding st um, students at the time. Again, it's all laid out for maximum cross ventilation. Um, and you could say that, well, you know, the idea about the experiment might be because in the case, in the real life, in the lived lives of the children who would be attending this school, they were much more conversant with different forms of space and use of space, but it's certainly unusual. But it's not something that only stays in, if you like, elite school situations, because I then thought about this a bit more, and I was looking at the time scale, and this is at the same time that Ari Sharon is designing the University of Ibadan, not the University of Ife, 1966 to 81. So, um, his idea was again for this open air inside outside space for the cafeteria within the um, residential block of the University of Ife. So the idea about this inside outside space is not new at all to 
the discussion in terms of how we can use space educationally, but it seems as though it always has been the exception to the rule. Most of the spaces for education, be they for recreation, well, apart from maybe football, as my first um, slide showed, have always been, um, in the case of particularly West Africa, and I'm speaking about Anglophone West Africa, they've always involved the construction of a solid um, space, uh, the use of the walls, the use of um, windows, use of a, a roof. So the idea about using the external space, which is in, in many ways as um, benign for most of the day, probably not at, at noon when the sun is at the highest, but certainly with environmental design, there could be much more use of outdoor space as either being part of the indoor space or indeed total outdoor use of space for educational buildings. Um, this has been something that has been experimented with in the past. And so I mean, I, I sort of thought about it a bit. Was it, is this something um, to do with the way in which education is perceived of? Or is it a limitation in the way in which the architects who've been involved in producing these spaces have actually had to, I guess, justify if it's a case of aid in the case of a lot of the schools in West Africa in the 60s and 70s? This was a UNESCO or the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development, uh, which preceded the World Bank. There were lots of funds to design and build schools, but with those funds came the, um, if you like, the links that the the um, the tie the strings attached were often that you had to use the concrete or the pre prefabrication systems that were being imported from the West, because I then sort of began to consider what other buildings have had a, a much more liberal approach to space. And this came through. Uh, to the left, there's a chapel in Akosombo, which again, even in, the, um, in, in um, religious architecture is not always the case. This was designed by Impreglio, the builders who built the Akosombo Dam in the middle of um, Ghana, a totally open air structure using cross laminated timber. So that's a case of there being no use of concrete. Well, probably the foundations are concrete. But I mean, this again is 1966, 67. So the ability to use space and indeed to use materials that are not dependent on imported cement and concrete was already there in the 1960s. And these are contractors, so they clearly knew where to source it. Whereas to the right, uh, I guess more aligned to education in the real sense of the word would be Max Bond, the black American architect who was very close to Kwame Nkrumah. He was asked to come up with a new series of um, libraries for Ghana. So these are both in Ghana, I should say Akasombo's Ghana and Bolgatonga is Northern Ghana as well. Um, and he created, this is the library diagram here. Again, it's very environmentally respondent. It's in a much drier area of Ghana. So the idea about total cross ventilation is secondary. But importantly, this is the children's library here. And this area here is where this open air auditorium is. And again, even in the main area, you can see this inside outside space beginning to happen. Um, unfortunately, again, this, these were one-offs. Um, we had to. Re I, I went to visit this site about three years ago, and in fact, very few people actually remembered it still existed. But um, it is part of the circuit for the Catholic Church in um, Akosombo. Although they were saying that they are not sure whether they'd maintain it for much longer, because um, I think it was more because of the location than it not being used. Uh, whereas this one has been adopted by uh, an evangelical church, which is good in a way because it means that they have the, the internal auditorium, which is here, which is supposed to be for the community, has now been adopted by this church, which is actually helping to maintain the building. But that's another story. But my point here is that the use of these spaces are the exception to the rule. Generally, the spaces that are being used for education, particularly in the West African case are much more standardized and they still basically focus around the um, original drawings I showed you about the classroom for 30 pupils 
and uh, a very standard link towards the teacher and the um, students. So the idea about child-centered education is only really coming in, but even then, the buildings that are being built, particularly the, the spaces for education, are still being very restricted in their um, interpretation of where education takes place. Um, and then just to discuss that further, though, there have been some more recent examples. The example to the left is in, um, in um, Durban, KwaZulu-Natal. It's a village, well, it's not in Durban, it's KwaZulu-Natal, and it's a village about I don't know, 100 miles away. And this is where I did find, again, the architect beginning to look at these spaces that I think were supposed to be um, spaces for junior primary, but in reality, the, bit, the spaces were really only used again for um, recreation and for lunch. So this, I think there's still that notion that the educational space needs to be internalized and it doesn't have much of a link, if any, to the external, however um, ambient the external climate is. To the right, um, I just put that in for context, context to show that there are times when these uh, systems work. This is a, a school building in Ecuador. Um, uh, agreeably, the architects are Ecuadorian. Well, no, I think they're actually from Colombia, but they were trained in America. But this, again, is using local materials and having the, well, the community is now part of the school and the school is part of the community. And um, so this is the Escuela Nueva movement, which is very strong in Latin America. But this is certainly not the case in um, West African schools. Um, and even, even this, if you like, prototype in, in this case, South Africa, KwaZulu-Natal, you would not see in uh, West African schools. And I think it's, it's one of these things where clearly a tr there's been a transitional legacy because uh, this school was built in the 1960s again in Nigeria. So, I mean, I then looked through my archive in terms of looking at former schools and so on uh, by a, a husband and wife team called Godwin and Hopwood. Uh, this was the building as at when it was built in 1960, I think it's 58. This was when I visited it back in 1998 or so. Um, but you can see that, again, the idea about, well, first of all, obviously, total environmental design, uh, but also the use of these spaces in a much more, I would say, um, flexible manner is something that has been done in the past. I mean, as at that time, the school was still um, perform was, was still working that way. So the top end are actually open air classrooms with some forms of, um, of um, partition. As, whereas downstairs was much more, again, recreational space. But generally the designs for schools today are much more, they're back to being enclosed. And in this case, again, if, we, if I were to do a critique, the materials again are concrete, uh, much of it is important, would have been imported at the time. So compared to, if you like, particularly, I guess, the either the Akosumbo idea or the Ecuador idea, um, there hasn't been that movement. But at least in this case, there was the exploration again of space, space being used that really responds to both climate and more importantly, the ability to use the um, external as more than just play space. You could actually have uh, classes and so on going on there. So, I mean, I, I, it's very much a work in progress. I think in terms of exhibition, I think the idea about understanding these spaces is really interesting. I mean, in all the cases I've shown you where there's the indoor outdoor, I think some have been particularly um, responsive to how the outdoor um, environment responds to the requirements of whether it's worship in this case or a library scheme or indeed the refectory, um, which again is integral, particularly in the idea about the campus university, which in Nigeria is very much the case. Uh, Sharon's work is very well known. I, would, I could then go on to a further, I might actually explore that more because he does use the open, or, open air and indoor 
interchangeably. So his main auditorium, for example, is totally outdoor and so on. But I thought just looking at a certain prototype of space like these communal spaces in an educational context is something that is worth exploring in terms of the typology and how successful it's been. But particularly going forward, this movement towards not developing it further, particularly in the public sector, I find very interesting. I, I suspect there's something around, number one, it's easier to be able to say, it's, it's much easier to be able to say, um, we've built something and this is the amount of money we've spent on it. And, you know, so there, there's that link between the infrastructure, infrastructure cost. I think the other thing is that symbolically, oftentimes, possibly a school that is built that has um, a lot of physical um, space looks more impressive, possibly, than, um, right, going back, right to my front page, uh, than a, a school that is seen as being uh, a hybrid between the inside and the outside. It's much more experimental, which in the African case, I think particularly might be something that, particularly at state level, is something uh, those in charge are less willing to entertain. But however, having said so, there's clearly a very interesting history of these spaces being used. It's just that they are the exceptions to the rule. So I think my um, thesis around this is to understand what has driven those exceptions and how we can actually begin to learn from these exceptions and how best they could actually be further developed to respond to today's education, which again is very different. Number one, it's much more child-centered. And number two, um, it's less linked anyway to the standard classroom. And I guess number three, the technology is probably more expensive, it is, than bricks and mortar. But also in these days of um, carbon neutral, um, sustainability um, focused design, we really need to be, um, I guess, reaching back out to the environment and looking at how these spaces both link to the environment and use the environment as part of the emphasis for future pedagogies. And according to my um, wristwatch, I'm into my two minutes time. I think um, aside from that, I think there are lessons to be learned. I think it is a South-South conversation. For some reason, I mean, I think probably the heyday of educational building in certainly um, European, um, British West Africa would have been the 60s and the 70s. I think there are lessons to learn around environmental design, but moving forward to the noughties or the 2020s from now on, I think it's re um, examining those ideas and then looking at pedagogy and how pedagogy can better link to actually bring the environment back into the discussion and particularly um, considering both the, the pedagogy therefore the materials being used and indeed the ways in which space become part of a communal uh, discussion between education space and place. I'll leave it there. Thank you.